What's up guys? Welcome back to Fisher Hex. My name is Travis. Today we're going to be doing my weekly email Q&A. So thank you for everybody who submitted emails. I actually have a setup so when they come in and they're titled a weekly email or something like that, it will automatically go into this folder, which is a pretty awesome so I can keep everything organized and not have to search through a ton of emails every week. And uh, yeah, so I actually made this video on Saturday and unfortunately after 23 minutes, I realized that I was recording uh, from the wrong microphone line. So it was just 23 minutes of silence. So that's always fun. Uh, either way, let's go ahead and get started. Now the first one here is, uh, hello again, I got a bad batch of reef crystals with a DKH of 2.7. Uh, that's extremely low. I think I've only seen it probably at six. Uh, yeah, so that's pretty low. Uh, the first question here is, would that be okay for a Fowler tank, which is a uh, fish only with live rock tank? And uh, yes, to a certain extent, if you do smaller water changes, but uh, if it was my uh, salt and it was my situation, I would actually mix uh, that batch of reef crystals with another batch in hopes of kind of evening out uh, the DKH because I've actually had batches come in with 11 DKH and then of course down to that six. And uh, that's one of the reasons why I don't use uh, reef crystals anymore is because not only the magnesium was high a couple times, but also that fluctuation in uh, alkalinity is just not really going to work well for my system. So I would say I mix it with another batch of salt and then stop using the salt and switch to something like maybe Fritz uh, when you're done with that actual uh, two boxes. But uh, yeah, so number two question here is how long does it take for a one inch acro frag to be a softball sized colony? Best case scenario uh, for me personally. Uh, if everything's going well and I have the lighting over the tank, then it's usually about uh, six to six months to a year. Again, depending on the type of acro, uh, one thing that you'll come to realize is acropora that are maricultured, basically grown out in the ocean, then imported for uh, you know sales. Basically, uh, those tend to grow a little bit slower. So let's use the uh, fish of hex millipora. So that came in as a maricultured unknown coral. I colored it up and then renamed it. Now that actual acro. Um, was really growing slow when it first came in, like almost no growth for the first few months. And then it started taking off. And now that it's been in a reef tank for about two and a half, three years, it's actually growing one of the, actually one of the fastest grown acros in the tank. And I think that's because it has adapted to living in an aquarium. So um, if you're looking to grow acros fast, I would look for the corals or acros that have been in uh, aquariums uh, for at least a couple of years, because that way they've already adapted and they'll grow relatively quickly. Now, uh, third question here is what initially uh, got you into saltwater slash reefs? Now, um, I haven't been in saltwater for all that long. I've done freshwater for, uh, well, since I was 13 years old. And uh, I just, I've always loved fish and I've always loved um, having aquariums. It's just kind of been one of those things. Uh, but uh, yeah, so after the deployment, I really was looking for a hobby that I could kind of uh, give it my all. And that's really uh, where the saltwater aquarium kind of took off. And um, I really love it. I enjoy it. And I, I don't know, there's just a lot about it that I really, really do like. And um, I think probably the deployment stuff is really what got me uh, pushing into this hobby. So yeah, I hope that answers your question. So that is it for uh, that email. Let's go and move on to the next one. Uh, hello, Travis. Uh, my name, I am a big fan of the channel here. I was wondering how to cure dino in a reef aquarium. I went on vacation and came home to a crashing tank filled with these uh, gookers. Uh, any help appreciated. Thanks for your uh, content on YouTube. All right, so dino is a, a bacterial, uh, basically a bacterial infection in the tank. It's it's pretty nasty stuff. Um, okay, in the past, I've cured it with a three-day blackout with 50% uh, water changes for two days after that. Um, and then, of course, removing all of my snails. I left the hermits in there, but I removed the snails because I found that the snails would die off because they attempted to eat that stuff or, or was at least around it. That was just me personally, and I've actually read some stuff about the snails dying off. So I would remove my snails, leave the hermits, and... Um, because once they die, the dino will feed off of what they kill to continue to grow. So uh, you got to remove the nutrients. So I usually do a three-day blackout. Uh, again, 50% water changes for two days. Manually remove, blast it off uh, with a power head. Go in there with a scrub brush. Get it off before you do your water changes. And then um, if that doesn't help within you know a couple weeks or so, trying to at least get it to calm down, uh, you can do your blackout again in a week or so. And also you can dose hydrogen peroxide. Uh, I don't remember exactly what the dose was for that, uh, but I did put it on an automatic doser for several weeks and then it was finally gone. So that's what I've used. Um, it's really about nutrient control too. Um, and I wonder what caused it. Maybe you had a power outage or something that caused the sand bed to die or a lot of inverse to die or something like that. So uh, good luck and hopefully that answers your question. 
Uh, moving down here. Uh, number one, how do you quarantine inverts and when do you know they are safe to put in the main tank? Uh, if you guys seen the video, my quarantine, uh, my coral quarantine setup is, is also my invert quarantine uh, for the 300 gallon. And uh, it's all about time. Basically, I give uh, any, um, let's do an example here. So I got a starfish from uh, Roscoe's Reef. Uh, when we were breaking down his tank the other day and uh, i'm going to put that in quarantine in that 25 gallon tank or 20 gallon tank whatever it is uh, for 30 days but if i was going to buy the same starfish at the local fish store i would do upwards of 60 days and that's really just to make sure if say an ick parasite or something came in on the starfish uh, you would be able to catch it or basically it would die off in the quarantine tank because it did not have a host um, i know it's a very slim chance but there are there is a chance of uh, if you're buying a, I guess, a shell like a hermit crab or a snail that the ick parasite could come in on the shell and or the water that might be inside the shell with that uh, invertebrate. And it could potentially release into the main display. Now, I've never had this happen personally. I've heard of it happening. Uh, people getting ick all of a sudden after even going through the whole process of quarantine fish. And uh, the only thing they could really chop it up to was that it was a bunch of inverts that they um, put in the tank. So um, not everybody does it, but I do recommend at, at least a 30-day uh, period on uh, all inverts. And then, of course, 30-plus uh, days on corals, specifically Acropora. And then uh, you want to make sure there's no flatworms, red bugs, or anything like that. So hopefully that answers your question. Uh, number two, can corals be dangerous to handle slash keep? What risks are there, if any, and how do you mitigate them? Um, the types of corals that are considered dangerous to handle or keep are like uh, the soft corals, zoanthids, palizoas. Uh, those are the only two that I know of that are considered dangerous. You know, Acropora and hammers and torches, frog spawn, that stuff, never, I never had any ill effects on that. And it really comes down to the palytoxin that is inside those uh, zoanthids and palizoas. Um, this, I guess, um, I, I don't want to be quoted on this, but I believe it's number three uh, deadliest toxin in the world is that palytoxin. Again, um, I... I read that somewhere, but, you know, not everything you read on the Internet is true, but I'm pretty sure uh, that's accurate. Um, and basically how it becomes dangerous to you is if it was to squirt up into your eye, if you're handling it, it gets into a cut. And uh, it really comes down to you being uh, susceptible or and or kind of allergic to that stuff. For me personally, um, palyzoatoxin or palytoxin has uh, impacted me on the uh, saw, the bandsaw, not wearing a mask and cutting up zoa rocks, inhaling that stuff. I've gotten pretty sick from that. Um, also, carpet anemones uh, seem to really uh, negatively in, in, impact me. Even with gloves on, I tend to get kind of ill from handling them, and hence the reason why I don't really touch them anymore. And uh, that's just me personally. So uh, pretty much the best way to mitigate the chance or lessen the chance of uh, getting um, you know, in trouble with those types of corals is be safe. Wear gloves, wear eye protection, cover your nose, your mouth. If you have cuts, uh, make sure you uh, have those covered. And uh, if you do plan on cutting up zoa rocks, uh, like I do here in the fish room, uh, I like to wear a smock. And once I'm done, I will ch do a, uh, you know, I'll change my clothes and also take a shower before I'm hanging out with my kids or being around anybody else. And that uh, has seemed to have worked for the last year or so. And um, yeah, so hopefully that helps. Uh, number three, I uh, was thinking of a six-inch six inch sand bed biofiltration only tank. Um, what are your thoughts and issues you see running such a system? Uh, I believe deep sand bed is considered four to eight inches, I want to say. Um, I haven't done a deep sand bed in, I can't remember the last time I've done it. And um, yeah, there's nothing wrong with having sand in your tank. It really comes down to personal preference. As you guys know, I don't like sand. I don't like the way it looks. A lot of people get on to me for that, but... Um, yeah, it's going to be great because if you have the deep sand bed, you can have uh, the, the nitrogen, um, you know, the denitrifying bacteria in the sand bed that will break down that stuff. But, uh, yeah, it, it really, I don't know. It's going to be good, but the, it has its ups and downs. Eventually, the sand bed will need to be replaced. It could be 5, 10 years down the road if you have your system up that long. A lot of people end up uh, replacing their sand bed then. You also want to make sure that your rock work is on the glass before you add the sand because you don't want to take a chance of having a sand sifting critter uh, moving that around and potentially causing your rock structure to fall over. Um but uh, if you're only doing it for, say, the benefits of the nitrogen bacteria, the, uh, the denitrify bacteria, um, I wouldn't do it that because there's other methods out there like bio pellets, dosing vodka, using that PO4, whatever the hell it's called. Um, you know, there's other methods out there besides having the deep sand bed. But if you like the look, do it. If, it, if you just like the look of sand in general, uh, go ahead and just do like one or two inches. It makes it very easy to clean with a shop vac or not shop vac. Did I say that? 
gravel vac. Yeah, you don't want to be doing it with a shop vac. But uh, yeah, so it's up to you what you want to do. Um, there are benefits to both types of systems. So hopefully that answers your questions. Uh, moving down here to the next one. All right, uh, Q&A for the week. Nick in the UK. Question one, uh, please see attached image. Are these flatworms? Let's see. Yes, those are flatworms. Uh, they seem to crawl out of the sand and up the glass when the lights are, go on. I scrape them off the glass each morning and kill as many as I can. All my SPS are healthy, apart from the worms being unsightly. They do not seem to harm my tank. Uh, is there any way to get rid of them? Would uh, it help to go bare bottom? Uh, going bare bottom would have uh, no impact on uh, the flatworms. I've had them in the past with a bare bottom tank. Um, it's really They probably came in on a coral uh, that uh, either uh, went through the dip phase and you didn't get the eggs, or they were introduced some other way, maybe uh, macroalgae or something. But um, yeah, so these are going to be something that you want to get rid of. And uh, you kind of have to be careful in the way you go about it. I do have a video somewhere on the channel uh, about how to get rid of flatworms. I couldn't tell you where it is. It's probably in the beginner guide or the 125-gallon playlist. And um, now what you want to use is um, Flatworm RX. I believe that's what it's called. You can get it at Bulk Reef Supply or eBay or something like that. And uh, you're going to dose the recommended amount. Uh, follow the directions on there pretty closely. Make sure you have a lot of carbon uh, ready to go. And uh, you're going to want to do that treatment uh, one week. And then two to three weeks later, you're going to want to do it again to get any of the eggs that might have hatched. It's kind of the same process as if you had um, red bugs for Acropora. You're going to want to do multiple treatments to get all the flatworms. And uh, be ready to have a big water change, at least 30 35%, if not 40 to 50% of your water volume depending on again how big your tank is if you have a 300 gallon you don't want to be doing a 50 percent that's just a lot of water probably unnecessary and uh, if you have a ton of flatworms basically when they die they're going to release their uh, toxins into the water which could really be harmful for fish and coral specifically sps coral and you're going to want to use the carbon in the water changes to remove them as they die try to manually remove them with a siphon maybe do a water change before you do the treatment to try to get as many out as you can and then that might um, kind of cut back on the toxic toxins that are in the tank. So hopefully that answers your question. Uh, number two here, or question two, what are your thoughts on dosing nitrate to a tank? I do an ICP test every month. It always shows nitrate at 0.01 .01 and recommends I get up to 2.0. My phosphates, phosphate is always 0.02 to 0.04, and my DKH is 7.1. I run a full Triton and have a 95% SPS tank. All water parameters apart from nitrate is spot on. Corals are doing great, but the colors uh, could be a little bit better. For the last three months, I have doubled the amount I feed the fish, but my nitrates are still 0.01. .01. I added uh, uh, what I needed to keep the parameters in check because of carbon skimming, etc. Acropower is the only other thing I added. Now, Nick, um, I checked uh, reef to reef. And it doesn't, uh, I mean, I, I had a double check because I was like, does does the ICP test even test nitrate? And um, and right here is the answer. It says you cannot test for nitrate with an ICP machine. Nitrate is not an element. Um, so I'm not sure what you're looking at. Um, I would need a little bit more clarification. Maybe send me another email with a screenshot of what you're looking at. I could better um, give you some answers here. But when it comes to dosing nitrate, I would not do it right now because I think we're a little mixed up on the water parameter that you're looking at. And um, if you've been double your feeding and it's still, if it was nitrate and it's still at 0 0.01 or, you know, as low as you say it is, um, they just, it can't be the right water parameter that you're looking at, especially if you doubled your feeding. So uh, get back to me on that via email and I will help clarify and fix this issue. So thank you for that. Moving down. All right. Hey, Travis, love your channel. You're doing an awesome job. Thank you very much. Uh, number one, I'm building another tank. It's a 120 gallon, four foot tank. I've never had power, a powder blue uh, before and wanted to add this fish at the end with a yellow tang. Uh, tank will be RAS dominant with a yellow tang and CCB. Okay. Uh, since uh, powder blues can be jerks, uh, how do you think uh, this may work out with a yellow tang in a 125? The other option would be a powder brown as they are more passive, but the blues color is amazing just because even uh, for a 300, you have a lot of tangs, and I believe you're adding more. Uh, yes, I am going to be adding at least four more to this tank, as well as a bunch of little fish. Um, now, I, I guess it's personality dependent. I mean, I've had uh, tangs of all sorts, uh, even the same ones. One of them is a jerk, and the other one's really passive. So I wouldn't uh, just chop it up to say that powder blues are more aggressive. Uh, for example, the powder blue that's in my 300 is really passive. But when he was in a 90-gallon, he was a big jerk. So it could be the environment as well. 
Now, when it comes to the 125 gallon, uh, two tangs would be fine. I think the powder blue and the yellow would be fine. I would get them roughly the same size and quarantine them at the same time. Of course, adding them at the same time will cut back on aggression. If you want to go a little bit farther and kind of, uh, you know, mess with that aggression or help, uh, help alleviate some of it, maybe get a third tang, like uh, something with a different facial structure, maybe a Vamingi tang or um, I'm trying to think of another tang that has, has a different facial structure. You just want to stay away from that kind of uh, pointy nose like those two have. And uh, if you want to do a third tang, um, understand that they will eventually outgrow the 125. But if you get them small and uh, you're willing to part with them when they start getting bigger and understanding that they can't be in there forever, maybe. Uh, what I like to do is I have clients that love tangs. And uh, once they get too big, I just buy them back for them or swap them out for a smaller version of that fish and or putting that bigger one in my 300 or selling it to another tank that's much bigger and more suited for that fish. So if you're willing to do that, then uh, yeah, maybe three tanks might be your best option to help uh, kind of uh, spread out that stress. So hopefully that answers your question. Uh, number two, uh, I emailed it uh, in through your site and let you know that I think the NIOS Quantum uh, 160 is priced wrong. Uh, yeah, I actually double checked that. Um, it was priced wrong. It had to be up a little bit more. Um, and so I appreciate you checking that out. Uh, when I was mass adding stuff, I think I just uh, duplicated the original post and just added a new picture and new title and forgot to update the uh, price. So I appreciate that. And uh, thanks, man. Hopefully I answered all your questions. Moving down here. Uh, next one. Uh, Travis, first, uh, as a Marine, one, once in, once a Marine and always a Marine, uh, I want to thank you for your service. All Americans owe you a debt of gratitude. I duly like your channel and find your videos very informative. Uh, thanks, Alex. Appreciate that. Uh, question one, uh, I've watched your uh, quarantine videos and uh, I'm now setting up a quarantine system. Unfortunately, maybe too late. I have two tanks, two clowns, five chromas, one ras, and one flame angel in my 90 gallon tank. Everyone has been fine for over two months. One of my tanks looks like it has a couple white spots. It's not a full blown ick, I'm, but I'm concerned. I don't think I can tear down an entire reef to catch them. Is there anything short of that that can be done? Um, unfortunately, uh, there's not really much you can do if you have if you can actually confirm it being ick uh, you know if you want to prevent further stress when you add other fish or maybe further deaths um, since the tank is relatively new um, i would tear it down and pull all the fish out or maybe find another way of catching them with multiple nets and having somebody else come help you or maybe get them while they're feeding that's how i seem to catch a lot of tanks get them while they're up there chewing on some food that floats and um yeah the, i mean the reality is if you have ick in the tank it's going to stay in the tank it might go dormant but when you add new fish or the fish gets stressed out for whatever reason, it could pop up. And then, you know, say it doesn't pop up for maybe a couple years and then your tank is already established with coral and looking pretty awesome. Then you get ick outbreak because it's been in there the whole time. And then you're just back to square one. So now that the tank is new, relatively new, at least I would remove the fish, quarantine them and go the 10 weeks of fallow period, allowing that ick parasite to die. So uh, good luck with that. Hopefully it works out for you. Uh, number two, uh, my tank is 36 inches deep. I've got a bunch of zoanthid and mushroom frags I want to glue on the bottom rocks. Uh, my arms cannot reach uh, that low in the tank. Is there any suggestions on how to glue frags in a lower rock structures? Uh, what I do personally here, because my tank is 30 inches tall, I like to use a little grabber. I can, you can get them at the local fish store. It just makes it easier for getting to the bottom of the tank, picking up frags or and or gluing frags to different parts of the rock structure. So consider trying that. Hopefully I answered all your questions, Alex. Uh, moving down here, it looks like we have three left or three emails left. Uh, love the channel. I bought some nice frags from you at Reefapalooza. Thanks for the support, man. Uh, what are your thoughts on a blue light aesthetic? Uh, it looks like your main tank uh, system is blued out. Uh, love the natural look. Or it doesn't look like your system is blued out. Okay. Um, well, the blue spectrum, that light spectrum in, uh, in particular, is uh, the best spectrum for coral growth and the zooxanthellae within the coral to uh you know, pull out the energy from the light and produce it for the coral to grow. Um, the white lights are really for us. I believe it was Jason Fox. Um, I don't want to quote anybody on this, but I'm pretty sure that he said that when he goes diving, the only thing, the only light color that you see when you're at the bottom of the ocean or at the reef is the blue light. The white and the the white, the green and the red gets filtered out through the water. So really, you're only stuck with the blue. Um, now, I really, I would run full blue all the time if I could get away with it. Um, but of course I like to look at my tank and not have it completely blued out. So, um, yeah, I really, I really like it. And of course having the blue spectrum is a must if you want to grow coral. So hopefully, uh, that answers your question. 
All right, moving on to our last email from JC Reefing. Question on quarantine. After many years of not quarantining, it finally caught up to me. Question is, how do I quarantine the remaining fish in my system when I have four clowns, hippotang, ras, goby, and a blenny that made it through whatever the hell took out my other four fish? Basically, what size QT tank would be big enough so I so it doesn't stress out the tang or other fish since they are said to need ample ample room? Uh, would a 20 gallon tank and a 10 gallon sump be adequate for this most people don't have money slash space uh, to set up uh, two 100 gallon systems uh, when they say tanks need 100 gallon plus or more uh, when it comes to quarantine uh, fish or multiple fish i like to use i like the 20 gallon tanks depending on the size i don't know how big your uh, hippo tang is but to be safe and they're going to be in there for 10 weeks because you have to go the fallow period of your reef tank to get rid of the ick um I would or whatever. I mean, you still you want to go fallow. I don't know if it was Ick that killed him, but you want to go a fallow period to make sure you can catch whatever uh, got that. And um, basically, I would go with a 40-gallon breeder. It's not too big, not too small. And I think the Petco dollar per gallon sale is going on uh, right now. I'm pretty sure it is. Uh, you can get a 40-gallon tank there, do a hang-on-a-back filter, a heater, or maybe do sponge filters with a heater. It's up to you, but I would do a 40-gallon but if your hippo tang is under six inches, you will you could get away with a 20 gallon, but be ready to do weekly 50% water changes to compensate uh, for uh, you know maybe the you know the water volume. It just might not be enough. So to be safe, 40 gallons. If you don't have the money to get that tank, uh, the 20 gallon will be fine. Just be ready to do some extra water changes. All right, guys. Well, that's it for emails this week. If you want to be part of this series for next week, definitely send me an email to fishofhex at gmail.com. And just, of course, title it email Q&A or weekly Q&A, uh, something like that, so we can go into this folder. And, uh, yeah, I hope you guys enjoy the video, and I'll see you later. Bye.